Kim Craden. Round of applause. All right, give me a second, guys. My energy level, so I'm expecting, oh, Lord. We're just gonna throw this up here and put this right here. And we're gonna just go for what we know, all right? I'm expecting you to give me, ooh, this, I probably look like an alien. <laughs> yeah, I don't. There we go, okay. See, smart people. Yep, that's why we need you. All right. Uh, all right. Hi, how are ya? Okay, come on. If I have to fake it, come on. Hi, how are ya? All right, my name is Kim Creighton. We're um, gonna have a lightning test. Is anybody gonna um, give me time on this? Cause I, there you go, okay. Uh, we're gonna talk about the ABCs of coding. For those who heard my presentation yesterday, it's very important to me that I expose as many people to technology and code as possible. Um, and this is the reason why. There are non-technical people working in technical um, positions. There are non-technical -pe people just out here just ignorant. And automation, this article just came to me today. Um, automation in factories has already uh, decimated jobs in traditional manufacturing, and we know this. And I said this yesterday. I don't care if you're, from the U if you're from the United States, I don't care if you voted for who you voted for. If you believed anything about those old jobs coming back, being retained, you bought crap. <laughs> These jobs are gone. They're not coming back. It's easier for a, a robot to do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no benefits, um, and, and people need to reassess their skills I believe every three to five, um, th um, two to five years. But it might be more than that. And we're talking people who are in non-technical positions. Um, also, Elon Musk is saying there's gonna be mass unemployment. What are these people gonna do? Um, you have educators who are teaching STEM, have never been in STEM at a day in their lives. What are they doing? Um, you have people, we already know that McDonald's is, the tr you know, fast food is traditional first job for most teenagers, that job's gonna be gone. Because I'm gonna be able to walk in, if I ate McDonald's, open up an app, order it, the robot will make that Big Mac and have that same special sauce on there that they need every single time, and they will give it to me, and that's done. If you can't fix that robot, there's no need for you, and that will not be a teenager. The ABC, so I, first of all, I think, Coming, uh, I think we're making a mistake by introducing everybody to code or the majority of people to code through web development. Web development is too complex. There are too many moving parts. There's CSS, there's HTML, there's God forbid JavaScript, and you haven't even touched the back end. Um, you learn one thing, you think you know it, you come back to it, and you don't know it. So I believe in the ABCs of code. I am an educator by background. How did you learn whatever language you speak? You learned your alphabets, your words. You use those words to make sentences, use those sentences to make uh, paragraphs, and you wrote an essay. That's how I think we sh should be teaching code. Teach people variables. What is a variable? How do they relate to the world? Let's practice variables. This is what variables look like in various languages. Ah, control flow, this is control flow. Let's practice control flow. This is what control flows look like in other languages. Connect that to variables. These are functions, and then you build. And so by the time people get to these online tutorials or having discussions about languages or going to boot camps, they have a background in coding. Everybody doesn't need to be a developer, but everybody needs to understand how to speak the language. And so that's my presentation. And stick a fork in me, I'm done. <laughs> All right, where's John Gill? There he comes. All right. How does this work? Just use the clicker. Use the clicker. Yep. Okay, so apologies to people who came to the talk earlier. Um, part of the talk with these three pictures. Only got three pictures. This one is Princess Cricket. 
She's whoever you want to be. Uh, in Bermuda, we have a, an annual cricket match between the two ends of Ireland, the red team and the blue team. She's whichever team you want to be. She, whichever team wins, she wins. She's you coming here today. She came, uh, or this weekend, she came here with an open mind. Uh, she wanted to learn. She's your code. She can be whatever your code wants to be. She's going on a journey through life. Which button do I click? Let's try that. Okay. So you go on your journey through life and you keep hitting forks in the road. You have choices to make. Am I going to use Java? Probably not. Um, .NET, Python. There should be a cheer at that point. Um, now again, in Bermuda we ride mo mopeds. So sometimes you're going down the road, you're going right. Because if you try and go left at the last minute, you're going to hit the tree. You don't want to do that. Sometimes you're walking along the road, you can sit under the tree and watch world go by. You collect data, you learn, you see what other people are doing, and then you can make a better choice about which way to go. But basically, we're all on a journey, and time is driving us along, and you have to make a choice. This is where we are now. I call this the tree of hearts. Every leaf on that tree has taken a journey, it's taken the forks, it, you know, some of us went up the Python tree, some went up the Java tree. Uh, we were surrounded by a solid community. We were busy solving the same problems. There's people over here, leaves that have taken a route and they've solved all the problems, but they're unaware there's another tree over here. This is where we are in the heart. This is where you get to compare notes with people who've taken different journeys, and that's where you learn when you see somebody else's perspective, how they got there. And this is where we get to take stock, refactor our code, merge in other patches. This is what we do. That's all I got to say. Uh, but stay in the heart and share your, share your ideas, learn from others. You're going to have to take your branches. Um, when you get to the leaf and you get a wave in the wind, that's your time to take stock. Decide where to go next. Down here, there's more trees on the way up. Some of these will turn into bigger trees. That's all. All right, now we have uh, Flavio. That's the one. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, unlike yesterday, um, unlike yesterday, I didn't prepare this presentation, so it is all going to be improvised. Like yesterday, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about to you guys is is about public speaking, actually. So I think it's a great thing. I think you you should all, if you if you if you if you have something to share, you should all be doing it. Um, people learn from this. There are videos about it. They're all on YouTube or, or somewhere else. And there's people um, outside of this conference that might actually benefit from, your, from the things that you're sharing. I know it is scary. It is scary as hell. It is, um, so I'm, I'm, throughout the years, I've learned a couple of things about myself when I, I want to stand here and I start talking to people. So I want to share some of those with you. Um, for instance, first and foremost, it is, it is great to be nervous. It is natural to be nervous. It, it happens to me every time. Every time I, get, I, you know, I go on stage, it's like I'm freaking out. And it is normal because I care about the things I'm going to say, and I care about the, giving the information in the right way so that people can actually consume it. And if you're not nervous, it's probably because you don't give a shit about what you're going to say, and you should give a shit about what you're going to say. And if you care about what you're going to say, you probably want to also practice your presentations. I'm terrible at it. I never practice my presentations. That is wrong. You should be practicing your presentations because it gives you an idea of how much time it'll take you to go through the points that you want to present to people. Um, and the reason, the reason I normally don't practice my presentations is not because I don't care. It's because I have a terrible memory, and so I'm going to forget anything, everything anyway. Uh, so as soon as I get on stage, I have no idea what I'm going to say. Um, and that's why I have my slides. And you've got to work on your slides. And working on your slides is extremely important. You've got to dedicate some time to it. Um, uh, unlike me, that is my slide. <laughs> that is my Twitter handler. Uh, um, you've got to spend some time working on your slides. I'm, I'm very torn when it comes to slides. 
because I hate uh, to be the only one speaking, I also like feedback, right? So I love people to talk to me uh, during the presentation. I like, you know, if I make a point, I make it like a bold statement in my presentation and someone disagrees with me, I would rather have that person stopping me right away and having a discussion that would benefit the entire crowd than going away without knowing that someone actually disagree with me and that there are some other points that we can actually build on top of. Um, so feedback is awesome and you, you want to get feedback from people, so you should always look forward for, feed, for feedback. Uh, the thing about feedback when it comes to presentations and talking to other people is that it is super hard to actually know whether you did well or not. Reading the audience is impossible. You guys are impossible. And I can be talking to you right now and looking at your eyes and I don't really know if you give a shit about what I'm saying right now or not. I don't know if you're having fun or not. I'm not I don't know if you're just falling asleep or not. And it is super hard. I can find one or two uh, people in the audience that are like nodding like every second and I'll use that as a reference. But that doesn't really mean that I'm saying something smart. That probably means that the person is just looking at me and saying like, okay, this guy is an asshole and I don't give a shit about what he's saying. So it's really hard to actually get feedback from the audience, right? So ask for feedback, try to get people, talk to people afterwards. And one more thing that you should know, you should feel comfortable in stage. So what, I have a huge problem with that microphone. I said it yesterday, like I, I'm Italian, I need to move my hands. If you give me an ice cream microphone, I'll rage quit the conference because I need to move my hands. So I want to be free, I want to be able to walk in the, in the stage. And for that, you have to rely on the organizers because they are your friends. They're here to make you feel comfortable and when shit happens, they'll help you fix it. <laughs> there you go. So, so uh, rely, rely on the organizers. They, they are your friends, right? They are here to help you. They are here to make you feel comfortable so that you can give an amazing presentation and the audience will be happy at the end of it, or hopefully happy. So if you get to two, three, or four people, you're done. Don't expect to get to 10,000 people in one day. That is impossible. Get to at least one person and make sure that you made a difference from one person because that person is going to take whatever you said to, some other, to someone else and it'll start spreading the same things that you just spread. That is it. I just improvised the entire thing. I don't even, oh, wait. So, yes, your. Jose Padilla. Bad idea. Yes. Okay, so yesterday I talked about juice box very quickly. Um, so I wanted to give a light and talk on it. Um, so I've organized a couple of technical workshops. Um, I've participated in tons of technical workshops and I really believe that technical workshops shouldn't actually be about installing and setting up, you know, development environments in Windows and Linux and Mac, um, unless that's what the technical workshop is about. Um, it just takes too much time from everyone and it's just a pain for the organizers and for logistics and whatnot. Um, you know, you have Windows Vista or some crap like that, then you have Windows whichever this one is, and then you could have this other thing on that. Um, and it's just a mess. And, and I think that we shouldn't be spending so much of our time um, figuring that out. So I built Juicebox. And Juicebox is a VM. It works on VirtualBox or whichever other thing like that you use. And it's based on a stripped down version of Ubuntu. And it has tons of things installed already for you. So it has, it's based on Ubuntu, it has Git, it has Python, it has IOJS, which now should be probably known. Um, it has Mongo, it has Redis, it has Postgres. Um, it has Sublime Text installed right there for you. And we provide simple instructions so that anyone at any kind of level can easily get started. 
It also happens to re reduce your workshop's dependency on a great network, a great access point and whatnot. You can put everything you need on like USB drives and you can share them around and you don't have to worry about the internet failing. You can ov obviously reuse this and people can reuse this in other kinds of workshops, not only in yours. And there's a great benefit of me explaining just one way, just one obvious and simple way of doing the same thing and everyone's on the same page and everyone has the same apps and everyone has the same setup, right? It's open source. It's based on Packer and we host a version of the 32-bit and the 64-bit version of it so you can download it instead of compiling the whole thing. It's on GitHub, um, so if you want to check it out, I'd suggest you know you take a look at it um, and give me your feedback and see if it works for you uh, at any of your workshops, either one you're attending or one you're organizing. Um, I definitely would like to see if more people find this interesting. It solves a real problem. Um, so yeah, that's Juicebox. Okay. I wasn't sure if I was coming next or if someone got skipped or what happened. Yeah, we got the order a bit weird. Okay. Jennifer, right? Yep. All right. Uh, Jennifer. All right. Oh, yes. Might need this. All right. So this is Startup Life. I When I had three jobs in the span of one year, and those were also three full-time jobs, that is not part-time, freelance, or anything. Uh, so these are the red flags that I saw at each of the jobs, which caused me to flee rapidly. So this is number one. Uh, number one, yes, I got the job. Sweet. So fun. Starting up a new job. Uh-oh, people are leaving. Uh, just a few. So I'm like, oh, it's no big deal. People switch jobs all the time. But uh, shit, there are a lot of people leaving. <laughs> this probably isn't a good sign. So bye. Hey, made a good choice because two weeks later they laid off 30% of the people. Uh, so number two, yes, another new job. That's my boss. That's, that's fake me. Um, boss does not like me <laughs> at all. I've still never figured this out. Uh, so let's say you have a shitty boss um, who's on a weird power hungry struggle because it's a, it's a startup and they're like, ah, now I'm rich with power because I'm a VP of nothing. <laughs> Yay, that's my awesome team of people though. So instead of dealing with my boss, I would just always go to my coworkers. They were pretty cool, but boss was still pain. So red flag number three. Yes, got another new job. Those are ch children emojis. And that is not to represent actual children working at the company. That would be illegal. Uh, but <laughs> that is to <laughs> represent uh, people with absolutely zero experience in what they're doing. And if that is everyone at a company, that is not a good sign. You know, it's one thing if someone has a really awesome idea, but no experience, starts a company, but then is like, I have no experience. I'm going to hire in people who have experience and listen to them. Not always the case. So if you see that, Maybe stop and get the heck out. All right, that's basically it. <laughs> yep. Thanks. Cornelius. Yes. Cornelius. I'm Cornelius. Um, this is a talk about an easy way to get started with Django projects. Uh, if you're a new developer and just want to get started, 
This is an easy way to do it. If you have a team of multiple developers and you do a lot of Django projects like us, this might be something that will help you if you're not already using it. So uh, two problems that we ran into at my job is that we do a lot of projects and one thing that we want to do is have a common starting point for all our projects that we have. And second, when you're starting a project, we want to cut down some of the repetitive tasks that we run into. Uh, Django out the box gives you a nice command, start at, but we want to take it one step further. Uh, one thing you could do was create like a skeleton project and copy and paste, but we're kind of lazy, so we wanted to automate everything. So uh, there's a great project called Cookie Cutter. Uh, Cookie Cutter is a command line tool that helps you automate the template of your project. So uh, it's written completely in Python. It's by the, one of the authors of Two Scoops of Django. If you haven't read Two Scoops of Django, I would highly suggest you check it out. Uh, and you can create any type of project, not just Python projects, but C Sharp, uh, iOS, Java projects, so forth. So they have a cookie cutter Django templates that we modified and we created Mojango. <laughs> so Mojango makes uh, a few assumptions that you're going to be running on Heroku, you're using um, Redis, RQ, Postgres, so forth. So let's look at what this gives you. So to get started, you have to download Cookie Cutter. If you have a Mac, it's Brew install. And then just from there, you say Cookie Cutter, you put it to your repo. It clones your repo, and then it starts asking you a few things, like your project name, and you can customize all these. And then you get down to around here, and you can just say yes and no to the things that you want to install. So like Postgres, I say no to Century. We don't have to tell anyone about our errors. Uh, RQ, Redis, and so forth, and foundation for the front end. And what all of these do is set different variables that you'll see in your project. And then you can go from there, and you can use those variable names to create like a readme for your project, or you have things where you can include or exclude things like URLs and so forth, which is super nice. And then your project structure, we have a lot of extra things here. So we have Gulp, where we're building the front end access, a proc file, like I said, that we're running on Heroku that's already set up for you. If you go into your Pi Caribbean folder, this looks like your regular Django setup. So it's almost ready to go out the box. And then here's just another example where we are using the database URL and Django decouple, and your app's already installed. So very simple, you can get a Django project up and running in less than five minutes. So if you're like a new developer, like I said, or you have multiple projects, cookie cutter is definitely something you might want to look into. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. All right, there we go. All right. George. George? Here we go. Uh, not a good idea. <laughs> Hello. All right. 
George, everybody. Uh, PDB stands for the Python debugger, which is a command line tool to help you find bugs in your code. Here's some simple code. It just takes. No. No. <laughs> I had the same problem before. Fair enough. And the projector is at max soon. That'll also be a thing. This is why you should not do live coding. <laughs> uh, there? So, All right. so it takes input, a string, a word, tells you how many times this word appears in the string. Now, a real good way to use PDB is with testing. You don't have to use it with testing, but I always do. So here's the test I wrote for this program. It says, we went to the store and we bought some cookies, should have the word we appear twice. Then we run the test. Oh no, there is a failure. Let us import this magic formula. The magic formula is import pdb, pdb.setTrace. This is the first thing you need to know about pdb. This is how you summon it. Let's run the test again. And now we've injected ourselves into the exact point where we put that line, import pdb, pdb.setTrace. Uh, we can type any code we want here, as if we just started a Python shell. We can define variables and ask what they are. We can even run functions. There are three commands that you need to know to use pdb. Uh, there's a lot more commands, but you don't really need them. The first command is n, which takes you to the next line in the code. It displays the next line for you, and this is the next line that's going to be executed. And you can do it over and over again. The second command is c, which just continues the program as normal. At, at any point, you can check the variables like before. But c continues the execution of the program, and it gets us to our failure. And the third command, let's run the test again. The third command you know, need to know is S, which stands for step, which goes to the next instruction that is to be run. So here it jumps to the countwords.py file, which is defining the function that we were just using. And no. uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we can see here, we can even run, like I said before, we can run functions. And it shows you what will you get as the output of the function. Uh, and he, here we can check the variables we have. What is word? We. What is text word? We. And we can check whether they're equal before the program does it. We can just check it right here. Wait, they're false. They're not equal. Why? And we like take a look and it's obvious because of the capital letters. So now we know this bug. We can fix it. Uh, and then we run the test again. Now we still have the import PDB line in there, so it launches PDB again, but we don't care now. So we just continue, and the test passes. Cool. 
So that's the demonstration. Use PDB, use testing. They're great. Thank you. <laughs>